Oh. Twas a few weeks before Christmas, and all through the mind cinema, nothing was stirring apart from... Wait, what is this? Two elves tippy-toe through the seats, dusted with snow and good cheer. With bulging stockings stuffed full of ideas. Above their heads, a loid is stirring. And hark! Is that the sound of a projector whirring? Cue merriment was sailing neath a glowing spruce tree. Tis time for Christmas with racehorse movies. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> oh man. Uh, tree beard. I love tree beard season. <laughs> tree beard giving Brian Blessed a piggyback into the mind cinema we go. <laughs> what a wonderful, lovely, poetic introduction to this wonderful festive mind cinema racehorse movie special. Thank you so much, Father Christmas. You're welcome. Uh, for gracing Good us. Boy. <laughs> Uh, he's off. He was very he's convivial. Off. I tell you, man. Are we? Are we the elves? Are we the elves? We are, of course. Stockings? Yeah, we're the bulging stocking elves, man. Uh, yes. <laughs> Finally. Hello. Happy holiday season. Happy holidays, everyone. Uh, merry times. Uh, happy times. All of the good stuff, mm, man. Absolutely. All the good stuff. How the devil are you doing? We are sending dustings of snow and seasons greetings out to everyone. Uh, lovely to be back in this adorned, uh, festive mind cinema with you, Graham, man. Yes, Francesca, the Mind Cinema manager, has put up some tinsel, um, which is a big fire hazard for Lloyd and his big festive pipe and cigar and brandy, so the whole place might go up at any it's second. It's okay, we've got, uh, there's at least one fire extinguisher that I know of, uh, I think next door in the chippy, but we'll be, we've got pretty much good <laughs> access to it, man, should anything catch a blaze. It's going to be fine. So what are we going to do today? We're back in after uh, a few weeks off to celebrate this holiday season Absolutely. with some festive treats, some lovely uh, nostalgic memories of what cinema and Christmas means to us, I guess. Yeah. And then we are going to take out our massive sacks and unload them onto the stage. You're going to be awash with uh, festivities and Christmas pitches. Now, when we discussed this episode um, last week, I said that due to some unforeseen circumstances, I was quite, well, more so unprepared than usual for this episode. And you said, in a very beautiful and poetic way, you said, we'll just make it like Christmas. We'll open our presents together and we'll sit down and build whatever spaceships we can build out of our assorted Lego bricks. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to have some... Very scant ideas. Do some unwrapping, surprise ourselves, and then work together on various pitches for the two horses. Maybe see how many we can come up with. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Try and make them as festive as possible um, and see what happens. That's the plan, anyway. So, I guess before we get into any kind of Christmas a pitch in, um, how are you? What have you been up to? What have you been watching? What have you been doing? Oh, I'm very well, thank you, man. I'm really good trying to get um, through some actual good films that aren't just Equalizer 3 and things like that uh, from 2023 <laughs> with a mind to creating my uh, top 10 of the year list, which I always like to do around this time. It gives me a nice impetus to actually watch something that's been made with films. some like good care and attention. <laughs> it literally is, yes. <laughs> 10 films that aren't Ant-Man or Equalizer. <laughs> like, oh, I can probably manage that. One in black and white, one with subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> One that's like four hours long and is challenging. Yes. Uh, yeah, all of that kind of jazz. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so I've been I've been really good. I've just been um, yeah getting in the Christmas spirit, man. Looking forward to a load of time off, which is wonderful. Every year, I always get a load of time off around Christmas to further nice. indulge in all these wonderful things that I've been indulging in over the last few weeks, man. What about yourself, dude? I mean, I think I'm quite festive. I like the build up. I like the excitement, the anticipation, the films that are coming out. Like playing, watching your favorite Christmas films, listening to your favorite Christmas songs watching favourite Christmas episodes and I, then I kind of I get excited because I leap over Christmas and New Year a little bit and I start getting excited for the year ahead mm -hmm. so I start thinking about plans what I'm going to do where I'm going to go what projects I'm going to initiate what projects I'm actually going to finish <laughs> imagine that <laughs> and I, I just get excited I get this kind of springtime energy in early December that I quite like okay crikey it's nice full of beans 
So do you have any kind of traditions or anything like that? Um, I mean, we used to be, uh, uh, not us, sadly, we haven't shared a Christmas, but uh, us as children, mm. I'm sure we had lots of rituals to go around putting uh, uh, treats out for Santa and reindeers yes. and little sherries and things. Have we replaced um, any of those kind of traditions? Have you got a time that you want to sit down and watch a movie? Or have you got specific windows set out for anything like that, man? Yeah, I, I always... Um, since I moved to London, or since, shall I say, whatever dear friends of ours moved to London a few years after I did, mm -hmm. um, big cinema fan, fellow university friend and film editor, every year we try to go to the double bill screening of Scrooged and Trading Places at the Prince Charles. There we go. Now, it doesn't happen every year. Sometimes they'll do one film on one day, one film on the other. They let it go yes, fallow. And sometimes <laughs> they double bill them back to back. And we always make time to see that that's a new tradition between he and i lovely and that's really lovely i mean i'll put it i'll just put the little disclaimer out there some of the content in trading places has not aged at Age all. well at all absolutely i don't think it was appropriate at the time either there's a few moments in that which were shockingly offensive but around that that film and scrooged with bill murray is such a lovely christmas double bill um that's a tradition uh, my sister and i on um, either Christmas Eve, while we're wrapping the presents, we'll probably watch the Christmas episode of Bottom oh. because Rick, Rick Mail is a, a <laughs> titan in our household. Absolutely. In my household and our lives. And, you know, the usual Die Hard, um, Lethal Weapon. What about you? What kind of traditions have you <sighs> replaced from your childhood? There will always be a Christmas Eve uh, meeting of friends of mine online to have a Christmas Eve computer game mm. uh, with each other to see in sort of Christmas on on the midnight, um, which uh, is nice. a lovely thing to do. <laughs> um, and I'll always be, I think, um, I'll take some kind of like dad-esque role in which probably Boxing Day I'll be like, right, we're going for a walk. All right, everyone, we need to sit down. No, uh, no uh, please, please. Great, please. We're going to the horses. <laughs> Get your, get your Christmas money. Uh, yeah, come on. <laughs> yeah, put it in the sack. I'm off. Um, have a whiff around. Uh, and and I will sort of like not insist, but I'll suggest strongly that it would be a really good idea to eat a lot of food and then digest in front of like a massive epic. Oh, nice. Um, and that would generally be my, my, my epic of choice would probably be the man who would be king, I reckon, man. That is oh. like just an absolute favourite. Um, Wonderful. John Houston, Michael Caine, uh, Sean Connery, like Christopher Plummer. Mm. I mean, it's just like, there's already, you're like, okay, this is definitely an epic man. It's about two nice. hours, ten minutes, so that's a really nice yeah. amount of time to just okay. sit there. Maybe have a little bit of a doze. That's quite fine as well. You'll wake up, there'll be action. Man. Yes. You know, it's always nice to watch an old classic and curl mm -hmm. up on the sofa, that kind of a vibe. So that, um, The Man Who Would Be King is sort of one that I, I love to get on over Christmas if I can, man. That's great. I love a Sunday classic. I don't have one particularly for Christmas, but I do love a Sunday epic. Yeah. I don't know, Lawrence of Arabia or, or Ben Hur or something like that. I love it. I think films that we watched as growing up over Christmas that weren't Christmas films that always reminds me of are the, the standard ones, like Return of the Jedi, the ones that were. Um, like movie premieres the, on Channel the 4. The movie premiere, or exactly. Yeah. Return of the Jedi was always on at Christmas. Yeah. Yeah, and that that stuck in my mind as a lovely Christmas movie. Other like actual Christmassy films, I did mention it, but and you've mentioned Scrooge, which has been a favourite mm -hmm. since I saw that. You know, when I was a wee boy, um, and then absolutely, it's a wonderful life as well. I haven't got mm -hmm. any other sort of like I must watch this at Christmases that are specifically Christmases. I just fall back to like our mm. Back to the Futures, our Indiana Joneses, yes, um, yeah, that's great show. and also it used to be Bond. Um, but there's now, always a Bond film on Christmas. That's why, yeah. and I think then that primed yeah. me for uh, the Bourne trilogy when that came out, and then that started to be something that was done in a ritual. Was right, we're going to have a Bourne day, and okay. we're going to watch three nice. to fill that Bondian void that may not have been there previously. One of my favourite cinema stroke Christmas movies experiences when the Lord of the Rings came out year on oh. year over three years. Um, my friends, I think I was at university. I was, I was in my first year when Two Towers came out, yeah. um, when we met. And I would go home because my mates back then absolutely loved Lord of the Rings. And it was an excuse for us to go <laughs> to meet up and go and see it on Christmas Eve or whatever, the new one. Oh, and we were just, oh, wow. this is back, you know, barely any internet around. So we were, we were, um, scavenging all year for an image or a grainy trailer or something like that to tidbits. stoke our love for yeah. Lord of the Rings. So those three movies over those three years were 
such a lovely Christmas mini tradition between us and we'd look forward to it all year and it would just build up the um, the buzz. So th- I watch Lord of the Rings whenever I want, but I do like over the Christmas period, if I can, to maybe like on the 28th yeah, in yeah. between Christmas and, and New Year. When everyone's in a, that lovely slump, in a good slump yes. way. Yeah, yeah. And then I'll have a Lord of the Rings, either a trilogy day, extended edition, obviously, oh, oh. all of them back to back over about 12 hours or one a day. Yeah, it's yeah. It's just really lovely. Yep. Yeah, I did that uh, two years ago, I think, and it is it's it gives me that perfect sense of like childish glee and wonder, and mm. that is the feeling that I want to feel around Christmas. I want to feel it all Very the time, magical. especially. It absolutely is. Um, cool. All right. Well, I think we've covered quite a lot of ground on Christmas, Christmas films, what we liked, just yes, what we Christmas loved, time. and like hopefully you guys will like pick up a few and enjoy them if you fancy. There's a pretty good, yeah. uh, pretty good few recommendations in there. I think, if I do say so ourself. Yeah. Um, so if we can inspire a trilogy watch or have you guys cozy down on the sofa and uh, watch one of those that'd be ace and enjoy if you do yes or indeed if you have any suggestions or ideas or recommendations of christmas films that you love to watch just drop us a line at racehorse movies at the neverpress.com and tell us all about it okay well i reckon that's about enough yapping for us should we yeah. do some creative yapping of some kind and pitch some festive horses cast open your stockings Okay, so we are back. We are ready to pitch two horses. I don't know how many films we're going to get out this. We're going to empty our stockings onto the stage, see what presents are in there, and see if there are any model kits. Build something together and see what we've got. So <laughs> what horses have we chosen? Where did we get them from? We got them from the 2 o'clock at NAS in Ireland. Ran on the 12th of November, 2023. So of these horses that ran, I believe I gave you a horse named... After you, I believe, because it's called That Lovely Man. Oh, I thought it was Hair Beast. Um, <laughs> yes, you absolutely <laughs> did. And in return, sir, I gave you, uh, as memory serves, uh, Must Meet Cecil. Well, I believe we released my horse first for the Halloween special, so let's get your one out the gates and see what we can do with okay. it. Okay. All right. All right. Must Meet Cecil. I've got one, two, three, four ideas. The one I like the most, or the one I think... It's going to make you the happiest. I will leave till last. That's going to be your main present. Oh. <laughs> the, now, I don't really have stories. I'm going to give you like a an outline or a pitch, mm-hmm. like a, a little idea, a setting maybe. It's something meets something. Oh, excellent. We'll I have it. a meets and a meets you know? for my when I'm bringing mine in. That's perfect. Okay. I mean, it is must meet Cecil, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. there's going to be lots of meets. <laughs> okay. Prepare yourselves. I'm not of the uh, eating right. kind. So the first one I got for must meet Cecil um, the opening scene is going to be um, black and white, some kind of Dutched angle, maybe um, a an alleyway, a New York alleyway in the, <laughs> in the Four Seasons or something like that. Just smokes coming yeah, out, steam all over the place. The yeah, yeah. yeah, and there's a cat that's, that's sort of silhouette on the yeah, on the side exactly. of a graffiti <laughs> <the> wall. wall. <laughs> so it's a Dutched angle. It's, you've got some jazzy trumpet and <laughs> <laughs> the, the soundtrack. You know, you'll see a shadow on the wall. Of a, clearly a Santa Claus is cursed <laughs> on, the, on the wall. <laughs> it's like, like, yeah, like Alfred Hitchcock style, like from yeah. the side profile. Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and then we'll have some kind of dialogue as a, I don't know, they'll say, like, did you get it, kid? And then a voice will come in, or a shadow, another shadow will come in from the other side. He goes, no, he got away. And then they, the Santa will say, well, we got to get him. And then the other guy says, no. I gotta get you. Pulls out a gun. <laughs> Bang! And then we're still holding on the shadow, and then obviously the body like slumps into oh, frame. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Santa yeah. is dead, blood trickling out. Last <laughs> word said alive. I must meet Cecil. <laughs> <laughs> it's the last word to say, okay. which is over, which is overheard. This is when the hard boiled dialogue comes in. You know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I kind of. I was just on my cigarette break. <laughs> When someone plugged Santa, <laughs> the camera will go around this like a, a dumpster or a grunden and there's just um, an old store detective huddled down on the step just having a cigarette on his cigarette break. Yeah. Because we're outside, these, we're outside in an alleyway of something like Macy's and the Santa that got killed is the store Santa. 
So my idea was it's um, oh. <laughs> it's kind of like Chinatown set in Macy's. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 And this um, this store detective, um, he's uh, he's an ex he's a veteran from the Second World War or whatever. He's got injured and oh, amazing. Um, he's really down on his luck and beaten up and he's he's um, maybe mocked by his other workers because he's slow. Maybe he's a bit or they think he's stupid or he's got a limp. He's got an injury, but he was a brave soldier and he's a smart uh, detective. But he's yeah, a store yeah, yeah. detective. Yeah. So he he's our entry into this. He sees the dead Sansa. He hears the must meet Cecil. So they'll have different levels of corruption. And the big plot that this Chinatown thing is that they're not going to turn on the Christmas lights or they're going to cancel the parade <laughs> or there's some kind of corruption because they're going to shore up Macy's and sell it to... Someone's going to come in and buy it. They're going to shore it up and sell it to... They're going to turn it into a goddamn dollar store or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A strip mall or yes. this modern... Yes. Fanda- yeah. This fandang- new fandangled thing called the mall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the detective takes this case all the way to the top of Macy's and... Um, saves the day, restores Christmas, ends with him turning on the light. But we do have to figure out who Cecil is. Right, of course. Well, like Cecil... So I think Cecil is probably someone very high up who dis- un- who uncovered the corruption and um, got bumped off or dis- was disappeared. Cecil, in all of his desperation, holding all of this knowledge inside his head, he goes mm. to the Father Christmas just as the, the Santa that we saw murdered at the beginning mm. of the movie, just as he is about to like close up his grotto. We see like this, <laughs> this, this, this businessman come with his tie all like, loosened and flop sweat <laughs> yeah, okay. all over him. And he's like, Santa, Santa, this is a crazy question, I know, but can, can, can I just sit on that lap one more time? And like Santa, and he's like... Walk, 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 come in. And he, like, this is a big boss as well. So the Santa's quite yeah. like, I've got to toe the light a bit, even though this is absolutely freaky. Yeah. And then this dude, like, comes and he just has a breakdown on Santa's knee and, like, yes. confesses so much of what is going on, maybe, or something like that. <laughs> yeah, it all whispers in his ear or gives him, like, a microfilm or yeah, something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll have lots of people within populating our story who are like, there's a the janitor, there's the store detective. They're all kind of doing, I guess, low-level jobs to some degree, but really that's the only job they can they could have got. They've all got this shared history of absolute, of being like war heroes that have been forgotten about. Oh. So we have an, an underlying kind of network or spoken language, like the hard language, but they're all talking in... Military partners like, yeah, yeah, to like each other. Trench code, for want of a better term. Yeah, but then when normal, <laughs> but well, when more um, when the members of the public come in, they just get back into their normal kind of <laughs> yeah, yeah, routine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, as a shelf stacker or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that is a mighty fine stall you've chosen from there. <laughs> you know, put the cigarettes out behind their yeah. back. Yeah. So we'll have a hard-boiled detective noir set inside a Macy's style supermarket that's going to be turned into a strip mall and it's the detective who needs to meet Cecil. And all of those army bodies, all of them, they're all going to lose all of their jobs, like all of the connections and emotional, uh, like all the emotional connections that they have made over the years working for this one store that they believe in and love and like they're all uh, helping put out those giant um, sort of like drummer man statues that you see in like the Macy's and all of that kind of a thing and it's this great (laughs) joyful thing that they do together every year and, and that's all and destroyed, man. Yeah, and, the, uh, and they will have it like the the Macy's S store, like uh, has like a soup kitchen out back, and it gives back to the community a lot, like that. And it's like yes. it's hyper. It's like the very soul of Christmas within like four walls is what this place is. Yes, yeah, so it's already kind of corporate America that doesn't want to be super corporate America by <laughs> being in the shopping mall. <laughs> <laughs> and so there will be the final fight, I guess, or gunfight would be a bit like in the hard way. It will be on top of the big oh. giant drummer man. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and the bad guy will fall off of that and land in the giant Christmas tree. No, the hero will fall off that, land in the giant Christmas tree and survive. Yeah. Uh, the other one will fall onto a load of like fairy lights and get electrocuted. Or yeah, yeah, like yeah. Or like a candy cane oh, and get impaled or something. Just as, the, just as something. they're about to turn on the, the lights to, uh, to illuminate the mall, Boom. Yeah. he falls into that and it blows. Up, falls down, and the, the Macy's sign is behind it. And they turn that on the <laughs> <laughs> and everyone's like down there like ooh like it's all part of this wonderful fireworks show, show. Yeah. yes yes yes, yeah, yeah. yes. <laughs> that's my very thin kind of idea for a noir <sighs> must meet Cecil that starts with the murder of a uh, a store 
Santa and the store detective has to, has unravel. to unravel it with the help of the army buddies that he helped out get jobs there previously. Yeah. And it goes all the way up to the top. Absolutely. Maybe great the fen, maybe the fen fatale is like the the PA or the secretary to the CEO, whatever they called them back then. I don't know if they were CEOs, but you know the yeah the, the, head of the, the chief store, or the the chief of the new shopping mall. The head of Macy's is probably quite cuddly and naive. Yeah, yeah, he's like a Queen's lovely. The past. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he's getting totally taken advantage of by by swish swish yeah. uh, mall yes. people who have come in and charmed him and completely taken advantage. Yeah, and he of doesn't realise so a bit homely. like in, a bit like in Meet Joe Black. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Parrish doesn't realise he's under a massive hostile takeover. <laughs> yes. All right, that's one idea for Must Meet Cecil. If I could have anyone for our security guard, this will involve time travel, but uh, maybe mm. won't actually, because I first went Brian Dennehy. Yes, um, nice. Please, uh, if we can go back a couple. Uh, a ditto, we'd have to start resurrecting people, and this is almost halloween but Peter Falk, obviously. Mm, and then nice. from that, immediately, Mark Ruffalo. Nice. Mark Ruffalo. I had Sam Rockwell. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Just, like, r- dishevelled, uh, ruffled, a bit water. Limpy. He's got, like, a brace li- a on his limpy, knee. Um, yeah. But... Super sharp, but it's buried way back. Yeah, yeah, And so yeah. every once in a while, he'll just pull out something. He'll just notice something, clock it, put it in his back pocket. Yeah. And then it just comes out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll see that with some of the interactions of him actually security guarding as well. But he always does yeah. it with a really sweet bent. He's never, like, hammering the kosh or anything like that. He'll always be like, I'm sure you don't want to do that. And I've spotted you do that. And I think if you take the uh, Toblerone out of your uh, sleeve and put it back on the <laughs> yes, shelf where like you it. found it. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, so he, he stops some kid stealing a Toblerone. Yeah. yeah. And then... Um, Later on, he steals it for him and they share it outside oh. in the alley. Like it's a rough, it's a little street kid or something like that. And he doesn't want the kid to get into trouble. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, he he'll fork, he forks over his dollars, man. No, he he'll forks over yeah. the dollars because he loves the store. So he just like forks over a oh, bit yeah, of cash of and then he'll be out the out the back and he'll give Sharing it to the kids. It yeah, yeah, that's exactly yes. it, man. Yeah. And the, these kids in a um, Sherlock holmes kind of way, these kids are the people he helps out will be like his uh, Baker Street irregulars. Yes. Like they, they'll give him some information on the street and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, as to the, the whereabouts of the disappeared Cecil, who has completely yes. dropped off the planet since the death yeah, yeah. of our man, Father Christmas, out back. Yeah. yeah. Must okay. be Cecil. <laughs> okay, that was one. That, that was, was one awesome. Idea. That was awesome. A, a Christmas noir, man. <laughs> there are not okay. many of them, despite Shane Black's best efforts, man. The next one must meet Cecil. Is going to be a <laughs> a Boxing Day epic made for you. It's going to be a sweeping Ed Zwick style oh. directed, stirring epic World War One film about a Welsh tenor called Cecil. And it will start maybe in 1912, so two years before the war breaks out. Yeah. And it will have, we'll have three Christmases with Cecil. We'll have Christmas number one when he's a young 14-year-old boy or 13-year-old boy, and we get to know his family, and we'll just have a nice vignette of him and his family and singing in the church. Not quite a tenor, but he's got a beautiful voice singing, and we'll set up the family in him. Next Christmas, um, 1930, I think things are starting to heat up, get a bit he- heat yeah, up and yeah. stuff. And we'll have a Christmas where maybe the family break down and there's tensions within the family because of what's going on. He wants to enlist or whatever it is. War starts, he goes over to the war. So it's kind of a journey of this one soldier and or this one boy who enlists and he's got a beautiful singing voice and he has a kind of indomitable spirit see some terrible things, but he tries to get through it. He's not incredibly heroic. He's not cowardly, he's just a normal dude, but he's just trying to get through it and he's helping people. He's got a voice. I was going to say, just, it is, it is like the, just his own, his spirit is um, what he brings to the, the squad. Exactly. And then on the third Christmas, um, they're in the, their trenches uh, on the Western Front. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Over, you know where you probably know where we're going to go with this. Oh, one. yeah. I'm so. I've... And, and then on the <laughs> other side, on the <laughs> on the other side, oh. on the other side of the trench at night, you start hearing some singing, oh. yeah, some German carols start being sung, and over on this side, some of the uh, the allies just kind of start singing along, and then Cecil with his lovely beautiful tenor starts singing a really rousing rendition of a carol which is then perfectly duetted by a german soldier from the other side and both sides 
kind of calm down and let them sing to each other. Yeah. And they had they had this real beautiful duet over the battlefield. And then as it's calmed down, there's some cheering and clapping and then some conversations start. Cecil introduces himself to the German singer, the German singer, and they start shouting messages of hope and love. And then obviously it all ends with the famous, they go over the top, but this time they go over the top to have their famous football match. Yes! And it's yes, a Christmas, yes. the Christmas truce of 1914. Oh. It ends with a lovely football match between them, um, which obviously turns into England winning 4 2 at extra time. <laughs> <laughs> with Cecil. No, no, take it, Germany. <laughs> yeah, Cecil pulls they a Mooney, dies back down. <laughs> <laughs> they go over the top, all singing Vindaloo. <laughs> they charge at the, charge at the enemy. <laughs> but it'll end, it'll end on a big sweeping um, sing-along, Christmas carol sing-along between the two, the, the Allies Aww. and the Axis forces and the big football match. And in the middle, at the end of the game, the Cecil and the tenor from the, the German line they meet and they hug and will handshake. Yeah, I, I, like when they're out there, we've got like the, the sort of football and everything is going on. And then one of them will clock the other's voice in the distance and they'll be like, oh, that's that's him, mm. that's him. And we'll see that sort of almost uh, almost like Crocodile Dundee ending when he's walking over the people's heads mm. at the, in the oh, airport. Yeah, yeah. We'll have that. <laughs> well, they start singing to each other. Yeah, 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 definitely. The, again, and they'll be like, what? <laughs> and then call and response a little bit. And they'll just, yes. he'll be pushing through all the, like, the celebrating songs soldiers and the trees to find each other yeah. and embrace in the middle of the battlefield man oh my yeah. goodness and we can repeat this throughout each three christmases um even if the first one there's no argument maybe the second one there is an argument but there's something that cecil does that just unites people just yeah. for one moment yeah using yeah. his voice or his kindness and they just have a moment all together and it's just it starts with with cecil oh. he's just this walking embodiment of sweetness and light that needs to be protected oh my goodness mate dude he's just a good old kid oh mate like when you were describing that a bit like in um dunkirk when tom hardy is gliding through the air silently oh yes i it's actually nil, started welling up yeah. a little bit there man. Yeah. <laughs> so i was a bit like oh no <laughs> i think it was just after i wrote football trenches in the bottom corner yes. before that and then you started football to talk trenches. about it. i was like oh sh don't don't make me cry on the christmas special man yeah. so right sorry okay. carry on carry on my third one um, is based, it's inspired by a true, thing, like the last one was inspired by a true story. This is inspired by a true person who's not called Cecil. Now, this is a person you know about. We've talked about this person many times. I've worked up a short story I want to write about this person. But he's, I think he's colloquially known as Mr. Christmas. Oh! And he's the, he, he's the, he's the gentleman mm -hmm. who celebrates Christmas every single day of the year and has done or did do for a good few years. So whatever day it was, he would go home, he would put on a, he would pull a cracker on his own, put on a Christmas hat, put on a Christmas jumper, have his microwave dinner, um, either on his lunch break or the weekends or in the evening and he would just basically just celebrate Christmas every single day of the year. When we were talking about this person it seemed to us without doing too much investigation that this person may have started this almost as a bet like they did it for like five days in a row and then after a while it's either like a bet or they just become known as Mr Christmas so therefore yeah, yeah. They, ha they have to keep it going because that's their identity now. So my um the two avenues, well, kind of, they, they come to the same destination, I guess. One is a local news reporter who's tasked with writing um, a story about Mr. Christmas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it might be um, an expert, it might be like a feature, or it might be an obituary, it doesn't matter. But this person goes around and like interviews all these people um, and meets with Mr. Christmas and spends lots of time with him because he's writing this book about him, and he's writing this feature. But to him, it starts out just absurd. Maybe he doesn't even want to do the story, but then he, he he's being punished involved. by giving that story, like by his yeah. editor, because he's like he did something it's or wrote something so, that was out yes, of line. Exactly. Yeah, and it's so it's such a ridiculous story. And um, he starts writing his notes, and he's very dismissive of Mister Christmas. He's very judgmental. But as the um, the story unfolds, we we start to realize why he's like this, which tugs at the. Um, the reporter's heartstrings, I guess, a little bit. But the wisdom of Mr. Christmas or Cecil, um, not necessarily the reasons why he's doing it, but the little things that he's holding on to, the 
the beauty of pulling the cracker or his loneliness or his maybe he's extolling some life lessons and it makes um the reporter realize what he's missing in life basically i've ripped off that mr rogers film yeah. <laughs> oh yeah beautiful day in the neighborhood yes yeah, yeah that one yeah a similar, a similar kind of thing where by uncovering this story um you learn more about yourself and you learn more about okay the the, the guy mr christmas is probably or cecil christmas is probably not doing things to a healthy degree but he's got some, he's got the right intentions and or the other route same kind of outcome is instead of um, beautiful day in the neighborhood which is in itself a kind of rip off of that johnny depp film um don juan oh my goodness with yeah with it? the uh, Marlon Brando. My family. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Marlon was, Brando. So, a, Mr. Yeah. Christmas, Cecil Christmas is assigned um, medically because maybe he has some kidney trouble from all the food or yeah, the sherry yeah, every day. Yeah, he's got gout. He's assigned, Goodness knows he's what else. Gout, yep. sort of. He's assigned a psychiatrist to talk to him about this, to unpick this. He doesn't really want to unpick it. He just wants to do his his course of 12 weeks or whatever it is so that he can get back into it. But, however, the... <laughs> Wisdom that he extols in the Don Juan kind of way reignites the cynic um, in the psychiatrist and gives them back um, a joyousness and maybe it gives them back a, a joyousness for every day of their life. Maybe the, they're only happy at Christmas. Well, that's the only time they take time off is to be with the families at Christmas. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, rest yeah. Of the, the rest of the year, they're just working. They don't have time for things, but they do at Christmas. And because they do at Christmas, that that... that absolves them of their failings of the year. I'm a great psychiatrist, but at Christmas it's just about my family, but that's not good enough. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. by by talking to Mr. Christmas, who lives Christmas every day, Cecil, the psychiatrist realised that every day you can have some joy, every day you can give, every yeah, day you yeah, can yeah. receive some joy, every day you don't have to build it up until Christmas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't yeah. have to use that as your, your present to your family. And that's how they unwind. And it, it's a kind of a Christmas movie in that way, so that it's set over a year, not just Christmas. And I'm seeing like some uh, some Goodwill Hunting kind of vibes for the uh, psychiatry. Yes. I want I want that like yeah. that. It's not your fault. <laughs> ho, it's ho, not ho. your fault. <laughs> I want that moment, but like ho, ho, he ho. does it. <laughs> ho ho ho. Ho ho ho. Ho ho ho. Ho ho ho. <laughs> yes. So yeah. that would be my third. That's a kind of a, more of a Christmassy. Well, they're all kind of Christmassy, but that's the third must beat Cecil. Are you ready for your main present? Right. Okay. So this one doesn't have a colon, <laughs> but it's got a tagline. Oh, oh, okay. Cool, man. All right. Must meet Cecil. Tagline Ho, 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 Arsino. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hello there, mate. <laughs> so we have an Arsino oh, adventure. Oh, my goodness. I've made a sequel to the sequel to the unpitched <laughs> pitch that you had for Arsino way back in episode one. Now, oh, mate. where we last left oh. Arsino, our intrepid New Jersey hood, he had just broken out of a Colombian prison after an escape to victory style football match. Is that right? Absolutely, yeah. He just okay. foiled three evil uh, prison custodians to do it, I think, man, and broke some of his mates out as well. So, yeah, yes. is this dude on the lam? What's going on, man? Yeah. So, Ars <laughs> ho, 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 Arsino. He's. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Arsino is obviously laying low somewhere in South America. Um, he's probably doing some low-level <laughs> gun running or some drugs. He's just in some st shady stuff, but he's got a, maybe assumed a false identity or something like that. But anyway, he gets word from back home, in from New Jersey somehow, <laughs> with telephone, and uh, it's serious. Um, he's just on the telephone. Um, you don't know what the message is, but he's having a lovely time in South America, and, you know, he's... We have shots of him playing football with the the kids. Maybe he's, up, he's working in a he's working in a bar. Um, he's just this weird kind of pudgy, hair slicked back Italian American dude working in some just absolutely bar sweating and, his ass off in a maybe bar setting up a, yeah. yeah maybe he set up a little pizzeria or something in like the middle of Bolivia or something like that. Um, <laughs> and he gets a telephone call, and you know it's serious. You gotta get here. You gotta meet Cecil. Okay. Okay. Something needs fixing, kid. 
and Arsino, with the help of a, a 12-year-old Colombian street kid, they go on a Temple of Doom, <laughs> romancing the stone style, romancing the stone, trains, planes and automobiles adventure through Colombia, South America, across the border, through Miami to New Jersey. Because he's oh, got to mate. get there in time for Christmas. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. uh, he's got to, he's got to meet Cecil. Because something needs fixing. That's all he ever says about it. Something needs fixing. So he's got this plucky, this plucky streetwise kid with him, who's his guide. Um, I can imagine some kind of shootout, dirt bike chase, shootout, stealing um, some drug runners Cessna aeroplane, and oh, like trying yeah, to yeah, like, yeah, yeah. hop out, just go off this dodgy runway, hopping over uh, into Nicaragua. And we've Lots we've got the map with the 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 course yes. of their journey on <laughs> yeah. it, depending on what they're taking and how fast it goes, etc. Yep, mm-hmm. yep, yep. People are on their tail. Um, every time they go into a new country in a trains, planes, and automobile kind of way. They get up to a different set of troubles. So they meet, they leave one set of bad guys behind, but there's a link to a new set of bad guys and they have to deal with some Florida people because the closer he gets to home, the more waves he makes, the more people come out of the woodwork. Yeah, we'll start with like just... Like the landlord for his pizzeria, come, uh, come, uh, like sort of <laughs> deli, uh, like like he's chasing <laughs> after him because he's like skipping out of town because he's like just going to blow yes. out of town. And he's not going to pay his like the rent that he owes. We'll start small yeah. and then just build up and up and up, <laughs> yeah. and he'll just keep accidentally infuriating anyone yeah. that he uh, accidentally or purposely double crosses to get a mode of transport yeah. to get closer and closer to <laughs> Queens or to, wherever to is Queens. his final destination. Yeah, Hoboken. And obviously, he becomes very close. He comes very close for the twelve-year-old Colombian kids, and his, his, he becomes like his short round, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, definitely. And so they they beat the bad guys, but he finally gets home to New Jersey just in time for Christmas. Um, again, in a plane, just trains, and automobiles, very touching, heartfelt moment. And he gets back, and we we realize, or along the way, we realize that Arsino is quite handy. I don't mean like he's good at beating people up, which he is, but he's quite good yeah. with his hands. Um, and it turns out that Arsino is actually has a secret passion as a carpenter. And he made a special wooden rocking chair for his auntie. And um, while he was away, the chair got broken. And his dad is desperate for the chair to be fixed so that he can sit with his sister at Christmas and watch uh, the TV you know, and he, it's not the same with his sister. She's not in her chair that my son made for him. And anyone can fix this chair, but no, it's got to be fixed by us. Got to be, got to be the guy who made it. Man. And so yeah. the call was for someone to meet his dad, Cecil, because the chair, something needs fixing. Like the chair needs fixing. <sighs> So, um, so and w- like within that is just the beautiful plea of "Come home, son. We miss you." Mm-hmm. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean, man? But like, and he knows that like, they I don't can't... know where you've been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like... I don't know where you've been or what you've got through, but come home for Christmas if you can. So he and the his short rounds that he repairs the chair, and um, his pops and his auntie, or the pops and the sister, sit in the chair, maybe dozing off, watching some flickering black and white CRT TV with blankets <laughs> over their legs. And then at the Christmas dinner, it's kind of the end of the scene. They're all having a lovely Christmas dinner together and the, the kid is amongst the family, very happy and accepted and it's great. And the um, they say to the kid, you know, Merry Christmas, that maybe they try to say it in Spanish. And a short round casually mentions that in Colombia, Christmas Day is actually the 6th of January because that's when the three kings arrive, which is true. Nice, yeah. And so they realise that's not actually his Christmas and they all look around the table, and then Arsino puts his head in his hands, put, puts his knife and fork down, goes to the hat rack, puts his hat and coat back on, gets the kid, and out the door they go to take him back to Colombia in time to have Christmas with Short Round's family. So that yes, we end well. on a further adventure going back all the way they came to deliver Short Round to his own family. So are we playing that adventure out or are we just leaving that as our teaser for like the next... That's the teaser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Amazing he just, man, like, We just have a long yes. shot of the dinner table as he just walks <laughs> from the dinner table down the, the, the corridor. He just whips so up a napkin on just put, dad's yeah, mouth, exactly. man. Yeah. <laughs> and he just like puts his hat on, puts on his coat and maybe 
maybe the kid, maybe the kid like stuffs some rolls in his pocket. Yeah, <laughs> just, like, <laughs> yeah a turkey leg. He just puts a whole turkey yeah, leg yeah, with like the top bit sticking out, man. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how we end. Oh. Must be Cecil. Ho ho ho, Arsino. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, right. The hat. I want his. Uh, his. I want like the busted up trilby that he wore for the first adventure yes. that he managed to get out of prison. That's going to be yeah. like his Indiana Jones hat. This battered. Yes. And cut up, like, you will have him just thing, like man. hang his head in his hands and take the paper crown off his head yeah. into the table. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh god, yeah. here we go. Okay, and obviously another Arsino adventure will happen where they don't get any. Maybe they go via Japan or something like Absolutely, that. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we we tease that like with a, there will be an Ar- Arsino will return that return. kind of a thing, man. You know, like the will, Back to the like, Future will, ending. Will Arsino return? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the red dot on the map is just going completely yeah. in the wrong direction. No, it just starts to draw a question mark and then it just ends on the dot and then out yes, credits, yeah. man. Yeah. Mid credit scene, they're both sat arms folded, looking really glum, like uh, assuming that it's each other's fault. And they're just looking at the camera very glum. And then you just see some bars slam across and it's got like a. <laughs> A Russian star on it, and they just ended up in a gulag or something. They just kaboom, like five seconds. And they go on, yeah, yes, oh yes. my god, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> so now we've turned what originally oh, was a, now it's like a screwball oh. comedy for us, you know, this ongoing oh, adventures glorious, around the world. Glorious, man, that's absolutely amazing, Dees. Oh my goodness me, wow, Dees. <laughs> We are, we'll, ping, <laughs> we'll keep ping-ponging poor Arsino <laughs> to and fro <laughs> each other <laughs> and see God what extra strange we can get him into, man. Oh, <laughs> dude, at least he got a couple of mouthfuls of turkey this time. He wasn't just, like, yes, locked up in, in clink or anything like to, that, man. He got to eat something. <laughs> poor sweet Arsino. Oh, dude, that was absolutely marvellous. That was your main present. Oh, I loved it. Thank you so much, man. You're welcome. Ah. Oh, wowzers. Wow. Oh, oh, dude, that is fantastic. Thank you so much for my presence, man. I feel spoiled. I feel absolutely (laughs) spoiled. (laughs) So I bring you the lovely man somewhere uh, long ago (laughs) in a place that looks a fair bit like sort of a medieval Scandinavia. So think uh, mm-hmm. a land populated by spruce um, boughs, heavy with crisp white snow. And in the middle of this dense forest, overshadowed by this massive, massive mountain, uh, is, is the, the sort of conurbation of Deepdale. So we start with preparations for like this massive end of year feast. As we are going through Deepdale, we'll weave through the town. We can hear like the sound of a distant hammer strike just far, far in the distance. And this is kind of the sound that's leading us almost through uh, this lovely village of uh, mm-hmm. Deepdale. Uh, it's getting louder and louder as we approach. We can see like the residents like greeting each other. Everyone's having like the best time. Everyone is absolutely yeah. gleeful. They're living in such this beautiful, absolute paradise underneath the shadow of this mountain. And this is where we're getting closer and closer to the hammer fall when we meet uh, our protagonist, uh, Axel Santo. Uh, who is a blacksmith who lives with his family uh, tucked in amongst the spruce trees and the mountains in this lovely idyllic place. Right. And he's like busy in his forge, man. And he's what he's up to with his family. They're all there in this line having a really lovely time together. Uh, and he is creating some little iron gifts um, that it's his job to give out each year um, to each of the households in this village to spread luck to the village for the entire year moving forward. Everyone's fussy, everyone's really excited about this end of year feast uh, and the amazing fact that he's been selected to be like the kind man, the lovely man that <laughs> walks through the houses of everyone each year. Uh, title draw. Yeah, I know, I know, there we go. I waited like 30 seconds before I jumped it in there, man. We get to see like him getting set for this ritual of spreading joy yeah. amongst, his pe- as, amongst his people as part of the year end celebrations. He also has to sort of like clown around as part of the festivities and he wears sort of like this jingly sort of hat that he sort of he is the chosen one the fool kind of a thing but never in a laughing at him he's always just walking around making people laugh as as the feast goes on and then when everyone's bedded bedded in that's when he spreads these uh, iron sigils that he's been making Mm. so the village is beautiful man it's absolutely banging it's full of joy it's full Mm. of christmas spirits everyone's eating everyone's having a great time man the feast is happening and as they are talking through sort of the the great luck that they have to be in such a wonderful position to the mountain that gives mm-hmm. them such metals to make the the tools and the armors and the things that they need and to make their village safe, we start panning away from this great feasting table 
and we pan to the mountain in the background and we start to move forward there. Because <clears throat> about to cross this mountain, Graham, is the warrior queen Dispra from beyond those mountains to the east. Nice. And her and her generals are looking down at the bright, bright glow of the village, man. She's got like three generals. She's got like Darren the Sly, Holber Grench, and Faye Slain Bodir. <laughs> You're so good at names, man. <laughs> Did and you get these off the back of a Warhammer pack or something? Would you be reading episodes of White Dwarf? And... <laughs> yeah, I've just been like going through like the 1983 ones I've got in the attic. Yeah, like, yeah, oh, exactly. hold no one pick up on this. Yeah, yeah what's the Space Wolf uh, leader called again? <laughs> I hold the Grinch. Yes, don't mind if I do. And with these these four generals is like a ragtag army. But this ragtag army <laughs> is like the middle of winter. They need a place to bed down uh, and they need a place rich in metals to like build some weapons for the uh, and some armor uh, to keep the this this okay. army on its feet, man. Uh, morning after the feast, we'll wake up Axel. Uh, he wakes with Jennifer hungover. He pretends that he's forgotten to sneak out. And she's like, oh, you, you fell asleep. You didn't like hand out any of the trinkets. And then we walk out and like <laughs> everyone is, and he's like, oh my God, I totally did forget that. And then he walks out and he's just like, ah, uh, <laughs> Jennifer, gotcha. would I come on? No, that's... And that's, that's the beginning of his like fooling and his fun that he's having this day as part of his role, nice. man. Uh, and we walk out, we follow him around as he is just hugging everyone. Everyone's hugging him. He's, he's clowning around. Around. he's rolling he's like pretending to drink beer and be all over the place and like going right, down to the kids yeah. and being amazing with all the kids and like oh are you sure did you get your trinket from the lovely man you know like checking all of these things making sure everyone's happy so they're walking around uh rousing the village he's kind of like that's his job is to get everyone up when they're hung over and get them ready for like the post feast feast uh, which is the morning tradition for the the day after year's end kind of a thing and then there's a massive like cavernous knocking at like the gates of the village and it silences the crowds as they sort of mm. make their way to the main square and this is where the queen has rocked up with her generals man and axel is not like he hasn't quite got the seriousness of this situation he's still completely in like ah oh, this is fun happy days mode mm -hmm. come in we got plenty man and the queen is just like yeah and we're gonna have it all and like his face drops for a second and then like Holber Grench, this absolutely like enormous dude, as his name suggests, steps forward and just runs poor Axel through. What? I know, man. Like, can you believe it? And we see like Axel twitch for a second and then his head rolls forward, rolls forward and the, the bell on top rings once more and then it's silent. What? You just killed off Axel? That was not how I thought this film was going to go. Well, doesn't matter. Carry on. I That's mean, not I'm not safe. turning it off, but... <laughs> okay. I yeah. did not expect this. You killed... Okay. I can go... I can think I know where you're going to go, but... Well, okay. Yeah, don't worry, man. Like, so... Anyway. They're like, right, get him out of here. They'll chuck him out the back where they shove all of, like, the, uh, the, the, the rubbish and detritus from the village, man. That's where poor little Axel goes. Mm. Um, so this is where, like, he's going to disappear... Um, he's not going to be in mm -hmm. that pile anymore. He's going to get himself out of, the, out of there. He'll go back to like maybe one of uh, the camps that the Queen and, and her, her people have left behind. Um, that might be enough for him to, uh, to find some solace from the winter, to find uh, the things he needs to sort of like heal himself and patch himself up a bit, maybe. Right. So have the, has Desperate and the crew just started to ransack the village or have they just taken over it? Yeah, they've taken it over completely, man. Like, already, like, oh, okay. Like, They're not ransacking and pillaging or anything like that. They've just. Like, well, no, because the Queen will need the people person. of the village uh, in a very Temple of Doom style. Right. So it's just, yeah, it's a, like a, a power shift. It's a, a coup, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, 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 but like a very, yeah, extremely um, uh, 180 degrees from what they were. So um, our man it was chucked in the pile of detritus, and but he's crawled himself away to regroup. Yeah, and he's fixing himself up, man. So what I want to do is have him, obviously he will fight these three generals, um, and each <laughs> of these generals, the first one, Faye, uh, slain Dottir, uh, she rides a sleigh, and it's kind of like this Mad Maxian uh, bladed, monstrosity mm -hmm. that's pulled by mm -hmm. these two sort of wild uh, snorting uh, snorting out great bellows of steam sort of horses kind of a thing nice. and she will be the first who is sent out to scout for the body because it's disappeared and like she is the most mobile she is the scout she has this like little sleigh to get nifty around him man and uh why do they want to get the body that's a good question actually maybe they want to get the body because she's like well fire up the furnace and blah 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 but we don't know how to work the furnaces like he can well, they, they've got this armour or they've got this thing, this sword, this forge that only Axel 
knows how to use and just by happen chance they're like oh fuck we actually probably tried to kill him yeah. get him back in yeah, here yeah, bring yeah. him back up yeah yeah no, definitely. He's not here. Yeah. go find him he's got we've got it we need this forge to work absolutely yeah 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 there we okay. go man that's exactly what we're gonna do and they go back and they're like well maybe he might still be alive back there and they go and it's just empty snow with trail blood. Of blood yeah that's it yeah. and they're like Oh my god, like what the hell's going on here, man? Right. And so she's like, find him! You know, the proper like willow baddie style. Yeah. <laughs> so him! Uh sends sends out <laughs> the best person for this Faye Slendotir on her sled. Yeah. Uh sleigh, sorry. Drawn by the horses. And so I want to uh, she will obviously fail and mm-hmm. they will find the two mad horses at the gates of the village, and that is the only sign that Faye has absolutely failed in her mission to go and get our man Axel. Mm. So when uh, Holber Grinch uh, goes to find, because he is enraged, we get like, a, you mm. know, when Carl is told of his brother's death in Die yes. Hard? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we get <laughs> when uh, Faye slotted, slain Dottir is, is, she does not return. We see someone yeah. uh, go out and we get, um, we want some perspective from the kid and the wife as well. We want to see what is happening mm-hmm. uh, as the queen exerts her tyranny over the land kind of a thing, man. So we're mm. going to get like some nice POV in there and we'll see the wife and the daughter and they'll do the Holly Gennaro thing where there'll be this great scream of anguish and we'll see her completely losing their stuff and they're like, wait a minute, like they went to look for dad and like, yeah, he's I think dad's that. okay. You know, I think he's all right. I think, oh my Only God. Only dad can make someone so angry. So angry. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's yeah. it. It's like, and so Sigrid is like so flipping delighted by this fat man. Her father's still alive. This is incredible. And mm. she kind of like, she's going to get a bit of a bee in her bonnet that she needs to get out there and see her father because now she knows he's alive. She needs to see him again. Mm. And she wants to like, just to, just to be with him, to check he's okay, to find out what's going on, man. So we'll have some of that happening. Um, while we're going through the movie, we want to get that POV from the village and we want to see uh, mm. brave Sigrid uh, start to hatch her plan to get the hell out of there and go and find her father in the woods kind of a thing as well. man. Mm-hmm. So we're going to send, like, the next to go out is Holber Grench. There is no chance he is not going after the person that killed uh, Face Lane. Mm. Here, man, he's absolutely enraged. The main henchman, the Carl... Yeah, yeah, that's it. And he's going to wear like um, these these massive robes uh, that were once uh, from like this great white heart that he hunted as part of the show of his amazing prowess. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just one of the many things he wears. And over the years, it's been stained with the blood of his enemies. Uh, and that is now this absolute sort of like crimson suit with some white fringes kind of a thing. And this is the thing that he amazing. adorned himself with and he's known with. And as you can uh, maybe working out here, each of these... Uh, <laughs> The generals that go up against our man Axel have uh, the iconography of Father Christmas. And so, <laughs> yeah, so I have to put it together, yeah, sure. Over the course of this film, um, we are going to see um, Axel uh, Santo. We are going to see him um, best and collect uh, the adornments from each of these people who uh, try and best him and enslave the people of his village. And so mm, we will get amazing. him wearing these beautiful red robes of Holber. We'll get him a sleigh that he has not yet, obviously, got anything to pull it with. Um, but we'll mm-hmm, get to that, I mm-hmm. guess, man, because he'll have to find their we'll way. We'll get to that, yeah. Okay. Right, so that's what's happening here, man. So uh, <laughs> yes. the daughter is going to... <laughs> so the daughter, sorry, Sigrid is going to escape. She's, she's getting the hell out of there, man. I think I think Sigrid needs a mission. She needs some agency, not just to, I want to see my dad again, but maybe she's got something that she needs to tell him or something to deliver to him uh okay you know what i mean like uh, the mom said like like here's a talisman or here's something that give this to your father this this is the thing this is the key the secret key to the forge i think it might be enough to get her out there in the first place if she just takes one of those things that her father's made one of the like the good luck talismans uh-huh. and like we're safe we we are alive your people are alive yeah uh, like I, I don't know what you can do dad <laughs> i'm sorry i'm bringing this like massive problem to your plate there's probably you've been like you've been stabbed a bit but like that's that's how it goes man so i th- i think maybe just that desire to say we haven't all been slaughtered while you have been like trying to patch yourself up over the last weeks like sort of months kind of a thing man yeah i'll get my brain ticking 
Yeah, 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 that's it. We'll come back to it, man. And we want this to, this will obviously last um, a full cycle of a year. So we're going to take it from the yeah, events okay. just after the uh, end year feast. He's living like a, a, as a mounted man now. He's out Absolutely, there he's... he is. Yeah, nice. yeah, yeah. And he's regrouping. Um, he's bested one. Uh, he's bested two, man. He's getting some confidence that he can, and he's like a big old blacksmith, man. He knows how to handle himself. Oh, could he, in, in this year, in this year, could he become almost, because a year is a long time for him to be doing nothing, really. Could he become like a, a, a spooky bogeyman for Desperate's men? Like every once in a while they send a raid or they have to go out to get firewood, they have to go something and like one of them doesn't come back. Or yeah, yeah. one of them thinks, it, a bit like a Bigfoot sighting, they think they've seen in the woods, they've seen the, a ghost walking or something. He's just around. No, they've, heard, they they've heard the bell on his hat. That's what they hear. Yeah, yeah, they something like that. So it becomes like a folk legend yeah, but every once in a while, maybe he does kill someone, or he does. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, or like, or something happens, and they think, "Oh, um, Axel got them." That maybe they just they fell down and broke their leg because they were spooked. So they think it's connected. And they're savaged by a wolf, and like yes. they're like, "He controls the wolves now." We, you know, <laughs> yes. it's like yeah, yeah. this is how it starts to build and build over this year, man. Mm. And each time okay. one of these nice. parties comes back, we get Sigrid and we get Jennifer, and they get more and more buoyed. Despite Despite knowing that there is no way their father can be behind all of this, they are buoyed by the fact that he is a symbol for this and he is clearly having a quite yeah. an effect on the people that are coming back and they are starting to yeah. see that power. The forest and the mountain is starting to protect. The complete power they had. Yeah. And yeah, and it's and and for the people in there who are the invaders, it's starting to lose, yeah. man. And it's starting to yes. be deadly. So um, we're gonna have uh Sigrid will slip out at some point. And she <laughs> will just run for her life. She gets, she doesn't get spotted because we don't want that reveal to happen yet. But we'll get the queen. Yeah. We'll find out at some point that someone has been uh, leaving when they shouldn't be, etc. Man, but like Sigrid gets the hell out of there. She meets up with her father because she hears a very distant. She hears that hammer ring that we heard. Oh yeah. After she's walked, like she's <laughs> she's covered a mile or two in the snow and is starting to get terrified, starting to think that all I've done is walk out and kill myself in the forest. Mm. And then ting, 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 psh, and she starts following this. Yes. Maybe she could do like a really in clever escape. Like there's a river, but she gets like a hollowed out log and like hides in it and just floats away from the, the crowds or something, from the patrols. And she just stays in this icy log for all the way down the river, very treacherous and very kind of but she uses her ingenuity rather than and just that's like it, yeah, to, outrunning it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, away. yeah, yeah. And then puts that distance between, and then mm. the call of the hammer. Ding, she hears the call of the hammer ding. in the background, which she yes. knows, like, like the sound <laughs> of her father's breathing. For goodness' sake, and follows and follows and follows, and we break out into this clearing. So we're a couple of months in now of of Axel being. <laughs> doing what he's doing in the woods and we break out into a slight clearing with this beautiful icy stream running down the center of it and lo and behold he has built himself a makeshift forge out there he's had long enough to establish this <laughs> this sort of like almost ice laden almost like a an igloo pizza oven but made so <laughs> yeah. well and constructed yeah, yeah, so yeah. finely <laughs> out of um, out of the wood and boughs and everything that he he is yeah. creating this insane fire within it man and he know this is his bread and butter he knows what he's doing and so she, Sigrid, who has not seen Axel for like three three months at least now, sort of breaks into this clearing and we just get this amazing shot of like Axel in the middle of the snow with only like some trousers on, just hammering. <laughs> so that got sexy like too quickly there. <laughs> no, my head, my inner thoughts took over from my outer speech and I'm so sorry I take all of that back. <laughs> like, Is he selling perfume? It was just such an aggressive way of saying with just some trousers on. I sort of... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so harsh. So harsh. Clang, <laughs> clang. <laughs> She's wandered into a Davidoff. <laughs> okay, oh, cut. <God. laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, we walk in and we see her father wrapped up. He's he's not just mm. got trousers on. I I genuinely like strike that from the record. <laughs> he's quickly, he's quickly puts on a blanket. 
<laughs> yeah, I turned into like Noah getting found like drunk and naked by his kids, man. I didn't need to do that at yes. all. That's not where we're going. <laughs> that ain't my bag. Amazing. So yeah, uh, she breaks out and he's like <laughs> like dressed up in all of the warm gear, <laughs> goddammit. And mm. you can't see any of his shape or form. He is not being objectified yes. at all. <laughs> uh, and we see him like hammering and hammering and hammering and like the sleigh that um, Slain Dottier left has been sort of like this. He's taken the, as much of the metal as he could off of it and he's like re-smelting it and trying to forge himself some like some weapon, something to protect himself with something. Uh, and we see him like douse the sword that he's making into the icy stream next to him. And he's got a really good damn setup going on, basically. And all of that is forgotten the second he sees Sigrid. He starts to like obviously just weeps and drops to his knees in the snow. And you see this massive plume of his breath coming out as he sort of like just sobs, sobs. And she sort of runs into the plume of his breath and through it and throws her arm around him, is weeping like, we're alive, we're alive, we're alive. Oh. And so they get over all of the uh, absolute wonderful and are so happy to know that not only is she alive, not only is Jennifer alive, but the villagers are alive, although they are being used, as I said, like the slaves in the Temple of Doom who mm, are being forced yeah. to work and work and work. They are still, for now, alive. There is still hope. They haven't just been ransacked like we thought they might have been when that's, they first kicked in the gates. Maybe they... They've been sacrificing people as well. Like the old people on the battlements have been put up and strung up and in, in a kind of like baits to bring him out. Yeah, and I can see it. And every once in a while he wants to try and attack, but he's on his own and he knows this horrible torment going on. You know. Well, that's what the daughter will say. Like, father, father, they've started to exactly as you said, because I yeah. can see just the people strung up and the tattered clothes hanging and mm. like the, the the ravens picking at the frozen flesh that kind of yeah we want some real yeah. uh yeah pulp conan energy to this man pulp so conan yes they energy, have. Exactly. yeah yeah definitely and that'll be the opening of one scene will just be like someone being hoisted up we'll just have like a, a dead shot of like the mountain and the horizon and then into that someone is just hoisted up dead and you see the dead eyes nice. of a villager kind of a thing and that's Death, and she'll say Desper like it's gonna be like the lamentation of the old will bring him down for the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. The next one, do not kill so fast. I want him to hear their screaming. <laughs> so and good. then the, ki and the kid is like, look, this is what they're doing, Dad. And he's like, look, I know. I hear their screams every night and it haunts me. And <laughs> it, and it, a bit, yeah, bit, of, bit of peace, man. I tried putting like third <laughs> things in so my far ears. Away? <laughs> Just trying to do my work. It's yeah. so far it's away. Just, yeah, you yeah, my arms hurt. I've got <laughs> to stand <laughs> in the side. <laughs> well, it's really hard. I'm forging. Do you see what I've got to work with here? I've got my rubbish yeah. sleigh metal. I've got, I've got to try and make that funny. into a weapon or something, man. And, just, and now you're here as well. I guess yeah, you want some lunch and pocket money, dude. Yeah, fuck, yeah, you know? yeah, come on. Get out of here, man. So of he's... Here. So he's like, she's like, yeah, he's like, I know I hear it all the time. And all it does is just make my hammer blows the stronger and it fuels each and every one of the strikes that I have. It's that kind of a deal, man. And then she's like, like, look, you've, and he's like, but this, this metal's absolute rubbish. It's not what I can work with. Right. It's not what I need. I need our ore. And I need our ingredients. I need, I need what we have. I need what the mountain gives us. Yeah. The secret is yes. like, well, the, the soldiers that have taken over the village, they've thrown all of the trinkets you made out mm. across the walls, uh, out, sorry, in piles around the village because they think it's bad juju, man. That is bad luck to have those things around. They don't like how it makes them feel. They don't like what it's for. And he's like, right, you have to rally the villagers and I need you to get them to, in a very Andy Dufresne in Shawshank Redemption kind of a way, to toss any and all of the sigils and the uh, charms that I made over the walls of the village. Mm. You must do that for me and I will collect that and that will be the material I need. Luckily, yes. So now the bit that we need to work out in this little bit, man, because he's got <laughs> yeah, a sleigh, Graham. Yeah, luckily but what I slay. need him to have is uh, nine wolves. Reindeer? No, 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 not reindeer. No, no, no. Okay. No, no, he's he's like he, nine wolves. he needs nine wolves, man, one of which will have a scar on its nose, as would Rudolph to uh, deliminate mm, the fact that okay. he is the leader. This is the alpha of the pack, man. And he's out in the forest. He's got like 
several months left before whatever plan that he is coming up with like has to be enacted man to uh, reunite and save his village so they can feast once more at year's end in happiness and joy mm -hmm. but i don't quite know how he's gonna come across these wolves or how he's gonna tame them he has to tame the wolves doesn't he? he has to fight he has to become the alpha well and i think that he will he has to give the scar he'll be to the, the one who scars the nose yeah. exactly that yes yeah, yeah exactly okay. that man yeah so he has to like a gray kind of he has to fight a wolf punch a wolf in the face take over their den yeah maybe, maybe he he rescues some that are like drowning and puts them oh. back in their den and and like ingratiates himself with them that way feeds them domesticates them to a degree they don't come near him because he's got fire and he maybe he like wards them off to start with and we have this kind of thing with his little forge that it's a protective thing but they get closer and closer because he's got food somehow i don't know where he gets food from oh he's hunting he's a good hunter man yeah he can make his own tools for hunting that's not a problem but he, le yeah, yeah. he leaves like in the village to mirror the the village where they're leaving the piles out of the ruins to ward off the the spirits or whatever they're scared of he leaves piles of meat for the wolves he knows who the alpha is you know, he's just kind of calm with them. Okay, so yeah, we're going to get a Dances with Wolves. One gets a bit too close. He scars it. Um, what the, he, the wolf scars him. He scars the wolf. So they have a kind <laughs> of like, okay, now we're... we're all right, even. fair enough. Like, we're, we're kind <laughs> yeah. of well, like, well, yeah. well, Wolfie, whoa, 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 whoa. easy. <laughs> we, we've all had a drink. We've all said a few things. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just whoa, whoa, whoa. keep it calm. <laughs> no, I know, I know. I didn't mean it. I've left you meat. <laughs> so yeah, he, he gets, he gets a, a simpatico with the animals of flora and fauna in the mountains around because he's a mountain man. He knows the, the area. Absolutely. But we will have this kind of, the wolves are a terrible threat to start with and they're a terrible threat to the village, um, the invaders. But to him, he spends yeah, yeah. a lot of time. And that could be a whole big subplot that he spends just a lot of time gradually, gradually ingratiating himself into this pack. So that is now where we're at. Like this is what like Sigrid goes back and she's like, like we get some really nice scenes with the villagers and we get to see uh, like Holber Grinch, who I th we won't maybe not have him bested yet. Um, I think mm. uh, like we'll have him as a seriously we'll... wounded. Maybe he, that's like, it. He's got... crawled back, man, and like has had the cape torn from his back as well, which is kind of yeah. like almost, as far as Holber's concerned, the biggest insult. That's worse than death almost. Because maybe he a... could. Um... He, like gets uh, an ear lopped off, or he loses a hand, yeah. and so he just trains right, hand, left-handed now, or something yeah. like that. He's yeah, yeah. He, he's been bested, and it's such a humiliation. Yeah, exactly that, right? So yeah, he's crawled back with his tail between his legs. Uh, absolutely, man. Mm. But so he is not yet dead. But but uh, our man Axel has obviously taken his final. He's twice as deadly now because he's so angry. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just like this raging. Uh, uh, thunder of a man at this point, man. And, he, and I like the idea of him just coming back to the camp angrier and angrier each time. <laughs> like, I want the first one, he like tips a table. The second one, he might like run at a shack and tip that over or something instead. Like, I just want it to and escalate the last more time, and more. They don't even open the doors to the village, he just like walks through them <laughs> like a Tex Avery cartoon. <laughs> so angry. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, yes. And you would have like a. Uh, one of the villagers is like walking up to him with like some food, hot food on a tray. See one of them just turns around, <laughs> like, nope. Yeah, just on a heel, they just go, <laughs> just <"Whoop."> heel. <laughs> I will save his dinner for later. Yep, yeah, yeah, Master isn't hungry, marvelous. He's, he's in a bit of bad mood. He's desperate, yeah. like, he's in a bit of bad mood. Yeah. <laughs> Give him a minute. But we'll have that actually. Like we'll have him. He'll come through and like genuinely do something like kick the main door of the citadel down or something <laughs> like that. And he's like, he's got like the blood is still sort of like pulsing down his arm, and he's just spitting and anyway. And, and then we'll have Durin yams his arm into like the furnace to seal. Oh the without, yes. Without, yes, without even like screaming. He's just so angry. Yeah, well, he is. Yeah, he's gonna. We'll make him the blacksmith as well because they are forging. They are extracting yeah, okay. metal throughout yeah. all of this, man. So he is the rival blacksmith to Axel. Okay, so he comes back without his hand or whatever it is, and he yanks his arm into some molten whatever lead to to steal it, and then he stamps it onto Axel's marker, his his brand. Yeah. So that he's always reminded. It, his arm is encased in metal now, and it's got. Axel's brand on it, so he's always reminded who gave him this weapon. <laughs> Obviously, he, he would forget that, but he's still, like visually, he's visually yeah, reminded. Like, yeah, yeah. No, every now and again he forgets, and then he goes to like scratch his nose, and he's like, ah. <laughs> but now he's got this, like, this metally stump, 
like before he goes out to battle or whatever, he's just like heating it up. So he's got this molten oh, arm that he's just swinging it yeah, like a it's firebrand a molten, that he's oh searing into people's faces. Oh, yeah, stuff. you can punch through trees with it. Goodness knows what else, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, fantastic, man. So like, yeah. So he's he's been like he's been coming out of the village raging, 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 yes. which is also distracting like Dispra and Darren from their Especially like nefarious. <laughs> oh, mate, he is honestly, big. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but like, like he'll he'll go for like uh, for the first uh, like he'll go three months in. No, he'll probably go like four months in and then eight months in and then when he comes back <laughs> on the eight months like he is he is livid <laughs> so he's he keeps coming back and uh Sigrid is also starting to spread the word through the villages and the villagers starting to get buoyed um much like our sweet sweet axel buoyed everyone on the morning of uh the uh after the uh, end of year feast man they are getting buoyed by his actions from afar they're seeing the disruption mm. he's causing they're seeing the terror that is spread throughout any of the guards who go out and do patrols all of that kind of stuff man they yeah. are absolutely and maybe they're, they're sowing the myth themselves now they, they weaponize their superstitions because desperate just thinks when they come in that these people just have stupid superstitions which they maybe do because they're very sweet and nice and easily invaded and their superstitions very sweet but what they do is they turn that against turn them that immediately around yeah absolutely and they they start building within which is their the, uh, these these both axel and the villagers are now sort of almost working in unison without quite knowing that they are <laughs> and eroding these guys from both sides now man like that is what's happening mm -hmm. in a very clandestine way axel is going to go and he is going to with the newly tamed wolves that he has befriended, man, they are going to go down. He is going to get them to pull him down. He's going to collect up all of the uh, materials he can from outside mm. that the villagers are left. He's going to get them back to the forge, man, and he's starting to formulate his little plan. Nice. And so he's going to start making weapons for each and every villager that lives within the village. And mm. it is his duty, or it will become his duty, he sees it, to give these weapons beneath the hearths of every villager that lives in that village still yes. on the last night of the last night of the year as was the tradition mm. with the good luck this is the best luck that he can give all of them man. Yes. so now we need to get word to axel he needs to get word back to the village to alert them to the fact it will be great to wake up to find a massive sword next to your hearth but we need mm. a bit of a heads up that this is going to happen so we can, like, oh, steal ourselves. Okay. Easy peasy. He forges a massive set of bells oh. and just rings them from his forge. Some Christmas bells. There you are. Absolutely. Oh, my... Dude, right, dude. You know the kind of traps in Rambo or Predator yes. as well, in fact, right? Yes. So you have, the, you have the massive log on a couple of massive vines and it's swinging, right? He yeah. is going to make sleigh bells like giant <laughs> you know the, the sleigh bell sticks you get he's going to make yes. a giant one yeah, of yeah. those and he's going to swing it through his clearing amazing and so that is his call to, that's his signal that something the lovely mm. man is ready for action now man and they know that he has told Sigrid he is like just let them know to be ready go time when they're ready they will know man yeah. and Holder is there and he is he is readying his arm in the furnace and he <laughs> yeah, is making that sigil glow man he's just sat at the there mountains of the trees yeah yeah that's it dude. yeah and I'm, I'm imagining him sat on like one of those little milkmaid stools um and it's just right into the roaring mouth of the furnace and he's just sat yeah, there just... like with his head down but his eyes up just looking yeah. at where the sound came from oh, it's getting redder and redder and redder <laughs> yeah. just burning and burning molten oh. yeah he's like mr joshua with the lighter under his yes. arm in lethal weapon in fact man but just like an epic version of that <laughs> excellent so he's there he's getting already everyone's getting ready man and yeah. um this is where our boy axel has to go down and sneak in the dead of night like he did when he was off when he was given the presents mm -hmm. and he places the finest sword that you could make in a couple of months so like let's give the guy a break if it has got a little bit of a bend to it or something like that man but he meet, he puts <laughs> the finest sword that these villagers have ever seen um next to the hearth of each and every one of them and so now we are ready for like the the displacement um and the final battle whereby we will have to bring down the legend from the mountain mm. to face the people mm. uh, and when the legend rides down from the mountain, he is adorned, he is on top of this sleigh and he has the the red uh, outfit from Holber that he's wearing, man. And he's got the hat that he wore as the yeah. lovely man. And he's dr leading the sleigh driven by howling, slavering wolves, wolves and looks yes. every bit 
the nightmare that they had expected. But to the villagers that see him coming down, he looks like a vision man he's absolutely yeah, he's incredible yeah, yeah. he's resplendent his huge yeah. white beard that he's been growing over the last year is trailing behind him man he just yes. looks absolutely magnificent and he crashes through and this is where we get our final fight with him and holber where we have to have that at the gates like that is holber yeah. is right up front already waiting for this with his glowing cigar of a hand ready to like bashes away a wolf from the pack you know oh, he just yeah. Yeah. Even flips, bam. yeah, okay. Yes, and we see the brand of luck. That is where we get just an epic slugfest. Just like the fight uh, at the beginning of Red Heat when you've got Arnie in a yes. loincloth. Uh, and I'm not <laughs> I'm snow. not lining up Axel again, I promise. That's not happening. <laughs> <can>. But like <laughs> You can. In the snow, like with the massive sound effects. Just like trees hitting trees is what it sounds like yes. when any of these people punch any of these people. And all the time yes. you've got like this great molten fist that's like sizzling on the cold yes. snow and burying yeah. itself into the walls and like melding with other bits of steel. It melds with the sword of Axel as he tries to bring it down on Holber's yeah. head. It's that kind of a... this, And then like, at that point Holber just wrenches the sword free and like pries it off of the end of his oh, blowing so fist and like throws it yeah. to one side and then Axel's there alone man but like I guess he's still got the wolves there to help him out a little bit and like with the wolves and with Axel and the fine blades that he's woven man mm. after the he's had his sword wrenched out from the from the molten fist and that's when that and they come up and they stand next to him and he reaches back and unsheaths his last sort of like forged weapon that he's got on yes. him man and that's when you get there the, the Avengers style almost the side <laughs> yeah, of the frame is one side of the frame yeah. is the other and bang <laughs> they're at each other again man and this time they managed to oh, finally so obviously good. best Holber man which leads them in now deeper to Darren the Slide. How do they best him? He's, he's, I think he shouldn't be best. I think they they think he should they've bested him. Like, are we going to call him? Carl from Die Hard. Yeah, 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 We're going to okay. call him. He yeah. gets mauled or something or they leave him for dead. His throat's ripped out. Then he becomes a whispering <laughs> Jesse. He's on the snow or something like that. <laughs> We've absolutely breached, man. And this is where, like, Axel is seeing the villagers that he has armed coming, streaming out. And in much uh, uh, the same way that we saw him at the start, uh, rousing everyone um, and getting them all ready yes. for the uh, post feast feast in the morning after the festivities. Again, the bell is ringing on the back of his hat and he is screaming this time, yes. the lovely man arrives! <laughs> and he takes, and as he's going through... Absolutely berserk. Oh yeah, he's properly like, I mean, he's been living on his own bar the uh, occasional visit from Sigrid. He has been living on his all own the blood for lust. so long, man. Amazing. And it's all coming out and all of the fear, everything is coming out of this sweet, lovely man on his he will be again this is the one time he needs to use it and boy he will man so he is rallying <laughs> everyone as they come through and that is when he will take them to the door of uh, Queen Dispra uh, and yeah. Darren the Sly who are there in their sort of and this is I want uh, very much uh, the the witch from Prince of Thieves uh, is is yes. kind of who yeah. we're looking at Darren is kind of that that forward the forward viewer he is the one who insisted that all of the sigils be thrown out uh, he is the one who has been fascinated and terrified by the idea of this mysterious sort of uh, uh, spirit of the woods that is haunting yeah. them. This is where, like, Darren and uh, Axel will... Um, Darren's going to come out with his... Uh, like, he'll have his, like, apothecary sort of sacks and yes. bags yeah, yeah, yeah. around him. And on his back, he has so got... like, phosphor bombs and stuff like that. Exactly that. And, like, all of these strange, noxious gases. Yes. And this is where we start to see, I guess, the sort of, like, the armours that Axel has made for him himself underneath his big red like Father Christmas-esque mm. uh, uh, fineries that he stole from Holber Grench. We start to see some of these protections revealed as he's like getting bits blown away from him and smoke and noxious things that are being flung at him <laughs> from like Darren the Sly are coming at him, man. So I, what I think I want is <clears throat> Darren will be bested. Um, he will be he will be sent out. Um, he will be banished, kind of like, and sent almost spanked with the the, uh, the flat side of a sword and sent back into the woods. Okay. That's sort of kind of what we're looking to do with Darren, man. But he'll pick up this great sack of potions, uh, Will Axel, as he kicks the door open to a uh, disparate sort of like final <laughs> hiding place, yeah. tossed over one shoulder, ready <laughs> to go, man. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> um, and uh, I, th I think that <laughs> I think that he is gonna he is going to uh, wrestle Dispra into the sack um, with all of its horrible, uh, noxious, nasty potions. Mm. And like I th I'm, I'm thinking, like maybe he'll crash it against something, and inside it, she will dissolve and be gone forever, kind of a thing. He's truly vanquishing, but I'm not quite sure how I'm offing uh, the Queen Dispra as such, man. What about if? Um, or cast her into the forge. I'm thinking like something with a lump of coal. Like he forces it into a throat, chokes her with a lump of coal. Yeah. You know, because that's what you get if you're being a bad per a bad kid. You get a lump of coal. Or, yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Or, dr or smothers her in, a, in some coal or some ash or something like that. Or uh, you know Yeah, I mean? we'll do. Right. Uh, next the to... smelting stuff. Next to the smelting pot... Uh, I don't. I. I. My blacksmithery uh, terminology may be slightly off. Uh, so next to that, there is this great just loads of, of hot ash. Yeah, sort of slag pile for want of a better term, man. Absolutely. Yeah, and he just whacks her face in it or something like that. Well, no, he 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 terminate a toozer into it. Yeah. Only no thumbs up. Man. Oh, just drops just, through it. Yeah. Yeah. T one thousand style. There we go. The queen. Into the queen yeah, not into vanquished. hot lava or anything like that, but it's just like boiling hot ash, like you have in a barbecue. Uh, the next day, when you like, stoke it, and it's just like yes. stuff, it's red underneath. Yeah, yeah, you're it's like, a really you're horrible, the... quick sandy kind of. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Melting absolutely. Into it. Yeah. Yes, yeah, absolutely okay. that, and like doing a Wicked Witch of the West, almost like I mm. melt all of this. Because she kind has of to. Jazz. She has to have her comeuppance for the very thing that she wanted to be in with. She which came was for the, the absolutely. forge and the weapons. Yeah, cool. Absolutely. Got it. Right. So she's, and then he collapses the sack at his feet. And and the villagers swarm in, and they sort of lift the now sagging because he's absolutely like cream cracker man. And the villagers have been like, mm. we see as he is walking through to get his quarry of uh, Darren's the Sly and uh, and uh, uh, Queen Dispera. We see all of the battles the villagers are having, the ancillary battles they're having with all of the sort of hench people that have been around, man. And we see that they are sort of like mm. they are winning the war because of the fine fine uh, forger forging that um, Axel has done, man. So we get to. Tell that story as Axel is on his way through the village to his sort of central point of the forge where the queen is, man. So we'll, we'll fill that in. And at the end, Axel is knelt uh, neath what, for all intents and purposes, this great forge looks like a giant chimney breast. Uh, and he is yes. knelt there, soot and faced, uh, covered completely, beaten. But the villagers start to come in. And as they come in, they put the sword that they've used into the forge and they rest mm. it sort of at the mouth of the forge to turn it back into the beautiful gifts that he gave and will give moving forward forevermore until he is no longer the lovely man. Yes. And then, as they're doing that, we have to have Holder come back. <laughs> yes. <and then. laughs> so the doors of the forge are kicks open wide, man. Charges and then like, like just him. like some poor villager just gets just a punch in the chest and is flown, <laughs> thrown to one side and he charges at him, man. And... This is where I want, like, I want his 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 molten stub to be turned against him, and just mm. like almost just like blasted through this dude's face, like in a gaze into the fist of dread kind of comic panel way, man, like <laughs> yeah, uh, Joe yes. Stred encapsulated nice. back in the day. Yeah, and bang, okay. he is done. So he keeps mm. these these fineries that he took um, to remind the people of the village. So each year he will dress for all intents and purposes as Father Christmas and he will ride around on the stolen sleigh wearing the stolen garb and his hat as the lovely man as a sign of the constant resilience of the villagers as he rides around delivering the uh, presence of hope for each one of them each year. Amazing. I loved the lovely man. I've got a, I've got a B-movie <laughs> ending for you. Oh, yes, please, man, yes. It's a nice one, though. I know, who knows? So Darren, the apothecary dude, throughout the film, mm -hmm. because he's a man of science to a degree, yeah. we, maybe he's in learning a little bit about the culture. He's learning a little bit. He's, he's kind of interested. So maybe he strikes up some little, not necessarily friendships, but some amicable arrangements with some of the villagers to get what he wants, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So after everybody's died, um, they banish him like maybe Axel goes to kill him and Jennifer or Siegfried says no don't kill him or an elder says don't kill him um he helped us when we were sick he gave us medicine it made us better it made us better as workers but it did save our lives so yeah yeah, yeah. okay it's, yeah. it's not right to him so we will we'll banish him and so Axel says okay we'll banish him 
and he gives him like a, a little knapsack with like eight lumps of coal in it, and he says like, <laughs> "Use this, make a fire, and fuck off." And so, yeah, um, Darren goes off. Uh, Mid credit scene, you see Darren. Even though he's a man of science, he's just a shit mountain man, and he can't make fire. <laughs> he can't use his coal. He's got nothing. He's just, and then you can hear the wolves, and he's oh. just really scared. He's running. He's just running. He's running away. He's running away. And that's the last you hear him. End credit scene. Some kids are um, playing out in the forest, like collecting stuff for the the oncoming feast. And they come into a clearing, and they see um, a frozen. Darren, oh. like, like a statue, and he's got the coals down his chest, and he's like covered in snow, like a snowman. Oh. And, he's, <laughs> and he, he's just froze to death with the. I don't know about the carrot on the nose. I was going to say, was he eating a carrot when he froze to death, man? It just happens to be directly in the middle of his mouth. (laughs) And they put a scarf on him and they leave him to it. (laughs) But for the last Christmas gag, he becomes a snowman. Amazing. Just like with his coals. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, man, definitely. And that nicely wraps up Darren, who we just left with a spank, but running out of town, yeah. man. Absolutely, yeah. that's perfect, mate. Thank you, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. I loved that lovely man. How did you begin to come up with that? It was all about seeing who I was thinking for Axel, uh, like, dressed as a furious mm. mountain Santa. Uh, after yes. he's collected all of the iconography, was just thinking about uh, Mads Mikkelsen oh. riding atop a uh, sleigh dressed as an insane Santa with a massive beard. And that's kind of where it started. It's got to be Mads, isn't I, it? Yeah. It's got to be Mads. Yeah, yeah, I think so, man. I like, mean, I've got Ron Perlman. Oh, I've got Ron Perlman for Holberg Grinch. So but Mads would be amazing at it. He's that totally that strong, silent stoic dude but i can see him as we've witnessed in that amazing movie another round we can certainly see mads cut loose yeah and have fun so who have you got for dispara so dispara i was thinking um wonderfully icy um the potential to be an evil warrior queen uh, and that's not a bad mm. reflection on rebecca ferguson i was i was thinking uh, oh. for that role <laughs> yeah you know just i just yeah i could just imagine looking amazing Rebecca Ferguson, perfect, absolutely perfect. Yeah, Done. just like just just made for a fantasy film to play good or yes. evil, man. Directors, I've decided I do want to go the Kevin Reynolds way. That's we need nice. we need that sense of big scale. You want something with a bit more adventure, a bit more spirit, a bit more kind of. Sam Raimi might be a shout. I want Sam Raimi. The um, Army of Darkness, when you've got everyone in the mm. castle who's doing all the preparations and they're hammer- all of the skeleton army when they're getting ready and the energy <laughs> and the sweeping yeah. scale that that has, as well as like bits of levity to bring things up a bit. And he'd be able to play on the levity of the villagers uh, turning the uh, spirit of the forest into more of a spirit than they actually are. Yeah. That is a, I'm having that, man. That is a With wicked the, yeah, shout. Like his camera's flying through the forest when some, of, when an invader is out there, <laughs> when a um, Baxter is out there fighting. Sorry, Chief. Oh, I've only just been put back together. <laughs> the amount of stitches, you'd not believe. I leak out bits of me I didn't think could leak. <laughs> Speaking of which, I only found one bloody leak. That's not going to make a stew for lads, is it? Raimi would be a good shout, I think. I also had Terry Gilliam. Dude, I'm... I... I like no offense to Terry, man, but just lately, hmm. yes, absolutely. Yeah, sure. But like, I th- I think Raimi design wise, I think he'd crush it. But he would absolutely nail it, and he would yeah, he would Raimi. do the good thing of making the scary things scary and the light things light. He'd be able to do that as well. Like, and, but he'd make it like quite upsetting. I think like Gilliam, which would be good as well. Like we were chatting about in the Halloween yes. podcast when we were saying the unsettlingness of some of those movies, like Time Bandits and things. Like he would bring that, yeah, which I'd yeah, like. Yeah. But I want I want to get Raimi, I want him I want him to get us a blockbuster out for Christmas. <laughs> I would love that so much, man. So yes, a hundred percent taking that, mate. Thank you. Oh uh, man, I absolutely loved that lovely man. So thank you as always, Graham, my sweet, sweet compadre, my little lovely joint <laughs> Christmas elf, for helping flesh out my stocking and to assemble the Lego we have assembled for each other and everyone listening, man. That's so much appreciated, mate. Wow. Oh, can I? I can hear the the sleigh bells in the in the in the in the distance, man. It's that's our cue. Yes. It's time for us to shuffle. I can off. hear carol singers amassing outside. 
Midnight Mass is a calling. Absolutely. I guess it's time to wrap up this and say one or two uh, well wishes to each other and to everybody out there, I guess. So firstly, Luke, uh, I love you very much. I wish you and your family, your loved ones, a, a wonderful holiday season. That I wish you spend it with joy and happiness, peace and love. Thank you so much, man. And uh, right back at you, dude. And that's not where I'm leaving it. Don't worry. <laughs> like, yeah, same here. <laughs> it's like, it's like, <laughs> yeah, you too. It's like, I love you. I know. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> so Dee, like, I hope you have uh, an absolutely wicked break Thanks, um, again all the best to your, your family your friends whoever you spend time mm, with man. have an absolutely lovely time Appreciate and for yourself as well mate have a really lovely time for you as well and make sure you're getting some uh, some treating yourself with some Christmas love too my friend yes. and I guess we'll be back we might do something in the early new year to wish in yeah 2024 with um, hope and happiness and joy for what's coming up. Yeah, a bit of excitement, um, mind, a bit of vim. Yeah, a bit of vim. We don't want the Mind Cinema to be closed for too long. We might do a bit of a spring clean, even though it's not spring. We might dust. I mean, you might clean the lenses. Yeah, there's the a projector. lot of blue tack and sellotape where all the decorations uh, yeah. are. We're going to need to clean all that up, man. We're going to have to give it a real going over. Empty out. Lloyd's ashtrays and uh, I mean that the the trays hmm. of his ash are big enough to kill a evil queen in man <laughs> <laughs> they are they certainly are <laughs> so we will be back we will um, come up with something that will drop into your earballs sometime soon but until we do from us and everybody at the Mind Cinema and at Racehorse Movies we wish you nothing but love peace joy and happiness over this festive season and we will see you very soon. We love you all. Goodbye. And now, the presents opened and the Christmas tales told. It is time to bid farewell to our two pitching elves and filter out of the soon-to-be-snowed-in mind cinema. We so enjoyed your company and send you out into the crisp Christmas air with our warmest wishes at this most special time of year. Graham and Luke will return and it shan't be too long. Until then, you may find them at theneverpress.com. Merry Christmas to you all! Oh, 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 oh!